Please be seated. I always enjoy the last verse of that song. Then we shall be what we should be when we would be what we could be. If we were, then would we would be. Um, so, <laughs> or something like that. I hope you were here last week um, or that you watched online so that you're up to speed having worked through the introduction as we take a brief break from our James study with plans to return to James next week. That said, I was brought back to James this past week with the verses that we read earlier in the service. As I sometimes do uh, share with you all that there are times where I'm really put through the ringer with something that I'm what I'm going to preach about on Sunday mornings and this past has been this past week has been one such instance uh, where I've been routinely perplexed by instances that that came up before me. I've interacted with some of you about this. I, I wrote about this some in the at Calvary column. Uh, I was actually quite encouraged by the by the uh, board, the Sunday school board over there. Uh, keep the sun in your eyes, and and that was. That was helpful. Everyone is different in how we respond to the stresses that are brought about by life. I recall being uh, in college with a group of fellow college students who are tasked with a ministry assignment, and we were driving to that location in, in a vehicle that was owned by the school, and the car died. And so we were stranded somewhere in Chicago with a vehicle that did not belong to us. My most vivid memory of the whole event was, was this guy who was a, a missionary aviation major, and so that's what he was going to school for. But the car died, and we're sitting there wondering, well, what are we going to do? And this, this guy... What sort of guy was it? He was, he was a guy who in college had a multi-tool on his belt. Perhaps that was you, where you, you never know. You just you strap it on each morning, not really sure what you're going to do. You might be that one to, to sit down and be like, oh, this, this thing's got a wiggle on it. And, 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 you, and you tend to it. Maybe that was you. That, that wasn't me, but... But the car dies, and, and this guy gets out of the vehicle, and he, he unholsters his, his multi-tool, confidently pops the hood, and goes up there and, and starts snooping around the engine compartment. I didn't know cars, but I figured something was going to happen, and I was curious. And so I got out of the car with him, I made some small talk and said, well, so did you grow up working on cars? Like, no, 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 I haven't. And, but, but he pulled out his multi-tool like something was going to happen. And so, so I, I was kind of impressed. I don't, I don't have the, the sort to be like, hey, 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 step aside, step aside. I'm going to be here and I'm going to fix things. I don't have that sort of attitude about me. But I was, kind of, I was kind of impressed that this guy did. I was skeptical, but, uh, but, I, was, but I was still intrigued. And, and the pessimist in me was thinking that great confidence with little know-how may not have been the best combination. But still, I, I was impressed with him. But I was also thinking... If you don't know what you're doing, 
uh, bringing a multi-tool into a situation might just be that you're bringing in a great conductor of electricity rather than providing the solution and it may ratchet our problem from vehicular to medical. And so I'm sitting there, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, I'm curious. And I don't even remember the end of the story actually. I'm not a very good storyteller, but uh, I don't really remember what the end of the story was. Um, apparently it worked out, apparently we didn't die there. Um, and I'm 70% sure that the guy didn't fix it. That's what I think. But there have been things that have come up before me this week, and there are things that have come up before you. And the way we deal with it varies. Sometimes we, we freak out, and we go catatonic, and, and we don't move because we're just overwhelmed. Sometimes we freeze, and, and someone else has to come in and, and take care of it because we're just not dealing with things. Sometimes we pause to pray, to, to gather our thoughts, and then construct a plan. And sometimes we just jump into the situation, confident we're going to make the right decision and figure it out. And all of us do this at different times to one degree or another. Th this past week, whether it was involvement or with others or whether it was just dealing with disheartedness, because of the naughtiness of my own heart. It, it could have been that almost daily I heard the phrase used, well, that's a gray area. And often, I don't know, I didn't know, what was the right thing to do. Something comes up, I don't know the right thing to do. I, I, I don't know how to advise you on what is the right thing to do and unsure of the decision to make even though I know I need to do something. And I've been weighed down by that. And quite frankly, tempted to take what had become a two-part message and wondering if we should just leave it with an introduction and move on. Yet one morning earlier this week, the verse popped into my head. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. H haven't we heard that before somewhere? Yeah. And when I pause and ask for such help, um, I do much better than when I just react. I don't need to go back and listen to a sermon. I just need to hide God's word in my heart and then see that his word will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. And that's my desire for us today, is that we will look at God's word and we will allow it to do a work in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for revealing reminders that we lack wisdom. It, it's kind of embarrassing that I've been so slow to come to that realization this past week, just busily moving from one thing to the next, not considering you, even though I'm here studying your word, but end up carrying around carrying around the weight that you alone can bear as all of this kind of became thinking uh, came about thinking about father's day i i pray for the dads that that the the burdens that that are on dads, not to take anything away from um, the ladies or the moms, but just with the burdens of life. 
that you alone are the one who can bear them. I thank you that you will impart your wisdom to us when we ask you. And the provision will be generous. It won't be, it won't be shaming as though we, we should have been able to do it on our own or we shouldn't have to keep coming back to you as, as though you are troubled by us and as though we are a bother to you. No. Keep us, Lord, oh, keep us cleaving to thyself and still believing. Continue to teach us through your word, as we ask. Help me to communicate clearly, I pray, in the name of Jesus, amen. The matter before us is, is that which has conspicuously come up before me in the past month or two. And then in the past couple of weeks, the Southern Baptist Convention had their meeting and voted on some matters that many regard simply as operational, elective, when they are, in fact, doctrinal. We discussed some of that last week. There are many areas which we consider to be gray matters, that which we cannot speak to definitively because the Bible does not speak explicitly to them. That's our thought. Alcohol is one such issue. And I'm aware of the fact that me even mentioning that has made some people uncomfortable, that I even broached the subject. But I remember an instance being involved in an organization, and this organization had a very firm um, position opposed to alcohol. I didn't have a problem with their stance, but I wondered about the reasoning behind it so that I could be supportive. I asked someone in the organization about it, and they kind of hemmed and hawed, and then waited until we were in a meeting, and then said, Ethan has a problem with the alcohol position, which is an indication he had no idea the reasoning behind it. And the response that I received was something like, nothing that stirreth in the cup. And I was like, there is that. Kelsey, you would understand being in this situation, wouldn't you? Beside the fact that you don't want me to point you out in front of everybody. But you would understand, right? Because somebody says something, and they're like, ah, nothing that stirreth in the cup. And, And it's one of those statements that is supposed to be an explanation, and you're just sort of like, ah, but did you consider this? How much would a woodchuck chuck (laughs) if a woodchuck could in fact chuck wood? As if that was going to somehow be a contribution as well, which was to say that I had no idea what he meant other than I probably shouldn't ask. And it was quite some time later that I discovered that I'd been King Jamesed, sort of. It was just sort of, like, it was just a statement that was made that was supposedly a standalone explanation all in once, and I, I, but I didn't get it. But here's the thing. The Bible, I'm just making an example here, the Bible affirms alcohol's benefits and it repeatedly warns about its misuses. So the rule follower in us says, well, is it okay or not? And here's the answer. It's okay for some, and it's totally not okay for others. But is that a satisfactory answer? Not for many people, because it's quite gray. Personally, I avoid alcohol. Uh, It's not because I think it's evil, but it's because I'm afraid I'd like it. And right now, I'm not taking applications for acquiring a problem. And so there are some warnings, and so I'm just avoiding it to be careful. Does the Bible speak to the issue of alcohol? Yes. 
does it give the does it give a thou shalt not to it? No, it doesn't. Does the Bible provide principles to guide, govern, and aid in operating with discernment? Absolutely. Obey the laws of the land. Don't get drunk. Govern yourself in a way that honors the Lord. So really, when it comes down to it, we are not freed for everyone to do what is right in their own eyes. As though Scripture is silent, simply because it does not express this expressly prohibitive statement. And let's be honest, even if it were expressly stated, we would be like kids and be like, well, why? Would, would our response just be like, oh, well, I just wanted to know, and so that's fine. We, we had a, there was a, a great discussion about this last week in Dartball. Tom, were you the one who brought up the wet paint? So, we see a sign that says, wet paint. What is our tendency? I wonder if it's still wet. I should probably check. And then, it went, it went oh, well, well, now I've got paint on my finger. They really should make a more convincing sign. It, it's always someone else's fault, but really... In this, all it reveals is that we are a rebellious group, we humans. If something is prohibited, we're tempted to cross the line. That must be amazing. They probably just put a wet paint sign there because they're really hiding the really good stuff. The Lord gives us direction through his word, and we need to operate. Here's, we're getting to your note sheet. I'm sorry, a lot of this is me just kind of talking. I'm trying to help us to, to think things through. The Lord gives us direction through his word, and we need to operate with obedience. We need to operate with obedience, not just hearing, not just knowing, but doing what God says. We need to operate with obedience. We need to operate with obedience in accordance with your conscience with your conscience that we must seek to keep sensitive to the Holy Spirit, not callous. How do we make our, our conscience calloused? By, by violating our conscience. 1 Corinthians 8 speaks about curbing my personal Christian liberties and to operate according to conscience. There are things that are not prohibited by Scripture. That's not a, we don't have a blank slate here. They're not prohibited by Scripture, but what's the first point? We have to obey. So when God says something, we have to obey. And then operate in accordance with your conscience. It may be okay for someone else but if it doesn't set right with me, then it's not okay. And it would not be right for me to violate my conscience by doing it. And it would also, here's the kicker, it would also not be right for me to impose my stance on someone else. Because there will be variance in the conclusions I come to versus what others do. The Lord gives us direction through his word. We need to operate with obedience in accordance with your conscience and with wisdom. With wisdom, which we are to seek and receive from God. Wisdom is sound knowledge applied to the living of life, but you can't supersede wisdom by being smart. Wisdom is sought and received from God. God, with obedience, in accordance with your conscience, with wisdom, with dependence, with dependence upon God throughout. 
not with liberated autonomy, I can do whatever I want. No, lovingly, dependently tethered to him. Unfortunately, gray areas often become battlegrounds, battlegrounds on which we differ on certain perspectives and we wish to portray them with black and white clarity. This is what I think, and therefore everyone needs to come to the same conclusion. They need to have the same conviction. And in doing so, we tend to overstate things in order to really make our point because it's really not gray. It's entirely black and white, and we end up overstating our point and pridefully make these litmus tests for fellowship. And we have seen much of this in recent years. And the result has not been simplicity and clarity and peace, but it has been fear, judging, and disunity. And that is not of the Lord, according to 1 Corinthians 14.33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. As we stated last week, God's word provides simplicity and clarity, and we need to begin our consideration with the Bible. Rather than seeking to subject the Bible to the skewed lens of fallen humanity, we saw in Romans 1 that unrighteousness battles against the truth seeking to suppress and subject the truth. How, how does this take place? Very, very sneakily. Changing the basis of consideration from what does the Bible say to what is popular, what is societally palatable, what agrees with my perspective. A month ago, I, I spoke with a pastor. Uh, he's someone I've talked to on a number of occasions. I've had limited interaction with him. But I quickly found a brother here who was wounded and weary. He's on staff at a, a church that is becoming progressive. We covered that last week. Uh, it is important when we talk about being progressive that we ask the question, progressing toward what? And conversely, moving away from what? And this man is burdened that his church not turn from the truth. And he has been met with statements saying, we need to, we need to keep in step with what the world is doing in order to remain connected. In short, they're afraid of being left behind. The, the world is kind of moving along, and we're not moving with them, and so we need to remain connected. And so now they're taking fluid stances on who fills which roles in the church. And, and really, d does it matter if they're male or female? Because... It just citing a pragmatic rationale. Hey, we're we're just being practical. We're only using who who's available and who is willing. And I was talking to him, and I said, they are projecting confusion. What is projecting confusion? Projecting confusion is implying that these are mere matters of opinion. And these are just matters of opinion, and so different ones will come to different conclusions because they're projecting this confusion that the Bible is unclear. But it is not unclear. These are matters to which God has spoken. And if we project confusion on matters where God has been particularly clear, there, there, there is no end to where we will stray. 
If we will not stand with what God's word presents, we will be confused on morality. We will be confused on what is sin. There will be confusion on roles among the sexes, which will lead to confusion among the sexes, leading to confusion on what is marriage and who is included in marriage. And I was saying all these things to this man, and he agreed and believes that that is where the leadership is heading because they are, they are following the pattern of the world under the guise of we have to stay connected. I asked him, and I said, man, man what, about all the, what about the passages that speak to this, that speak to the contrary? How, how can they even claim to do these things claiming biblical support? And the response he has received is, well, that's your interpretation. How is that for some comeuppance? For many years, we have been asking that postmodern question in Bible studies, what does this passage mean to you? Quite frankly, it doesn't matter what the passage means to me. If we go off the basis of what does it mean to me, you can explain away everything from that basis. But rather, what does, what does the passage mean? What does the passage mean? What did the author intend? I asked this pastor, why are those passage that speak clearly to the matter discounted as that's your interpretation? Why is the same not applied to discount their interpretation? Why does their interpretation trump what has been widely understood throughout biblical history? Any guesses on, on what the follow-up to that is? The response here was received, that he received is, we have the votes. This is the direction we're going. Dear people, I'm, I'm not talking about society. I'm not talking about Democrats. I'm not talking about Republicans. I'm talking to the church. What I'm talking about is the church. We need to cling, cling to what is true, to what is good. And we need to abhor what is evil. We need a sign. Just to, just to be clear. Thank you, Baba. Truth established by votes? Truth dictated by pragmatism, whatever works? Truth that is subjected to popular, what's popular, what will draw a crowd, what will bring in money, what will bring in workers? No, that's backwards. That is projecting confusion when God has spoken. That is suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Romans 1.18, suppressing the truth. And this is happening in a non-denominational church. I'm not going to tell you where because it doesn't matter, but it's, th this is our camp, dear people. These ones who claim to believe the Bible. But when efforts are made to remove a subject from theological consideration, to imply that God has nothing to say about the matter, when he has spoken, when that is done, these are not, true things I'm saying. I'm, this is always very confusing. When that is done, there are few, if any, courses of actions that are impermissible. Even if 
we claim them to be Christian because I'm a Christian and I'm okay with it and therefore it's Christian. No. If there is no standard to which we must adhere, and, and, and what I mean, I mean a real standard. Do you know what a real standard is? Do you know what a real parent with real standards says now and then? No. A real standard actually says no to something. Believing everything and believing nothing are the same. Standards will say that this is not okay. This is in bounds. This is out of bounds. If there is no clear word on the matter, then who can ever say that the resulting decision is wrong? I'm taking you just through this logically. Because all of a sudden, nothing is simple. Nothing is clear. And where have we got? Nothing is true. All truth is subjective, right? That is not true. Dear people, everything is not legalism. Everything is not legalism simply because we adhere to a standard. Also, not everything is gray. Order is a good thing. Value accompanies order. Value accompanies order and disorder or to discount something by saying it doesn't matter undermines value. Value accompanies order, disorder undermines value. I was thinking about the early practice of reading scripture from a scroll and I was wanting us to walk our way through a passage today by by covering a few chapters and making some simple observations. Observing the order and the value that is communicated in the order. And in the process, because you haven't been refreshed yet, but in the process to be refreshed by the clarity the Word of God provides. To sit up and take notice. That's why we routinely stand for the reading of God's word. Why? Because it's important. Because God is talking. And so we stand up and we take notice and we conclude with the word of the Lord and the response of thanks be to God. And I know you're already settled, but here, here I'll give you some directions here. We're going to be standing up here. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. That's on the first page that's a real Bible. If you're at the table of contents, keep going. And you have your note sheet there. This is this is where we're gonna be, so you're not gonna have to you don't have to deal with hymnals. We should be able to stand up and then sit down and take notes reasonably. I have a lot of faith in your coordination. I really do. Let's stand. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. And we're just going to read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light and the darkness he called night. Or he called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and 
the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light on the earth, and it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. So the evening and morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the air, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed, blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God every, saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and morning were the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So let's make some observations. In Genesis 1, we learn about the creation. What's the significance of this? It's hugely significant, hugely significant. It answers this question, where did I come from? That, that's, one of those, that's one of those big, where do I find my place in the world? Where did I come from? We learn that the creation was miraculous. The creation was miraculous. It did not come about through natural processes. And miraculous does not mean improbable or statistically unlikely. The creation was miraculous, not improbable. Another observation, God did it. God did it. Not some other force. Not some other process. God did it. And it was good. Verse 10, 12, 18, 25. And very good in verse 31, actually. Verse 4 also said, God saw the light that it was good. So you can add to that. It was good. That's an observation. 
That's God making an assessment. That's also a declaration from God that it was good. And we learn about man. So with creation, we learn, okay, where did I come from? When we learn about man, who am I? Who is man? Man is made in the image of God. Not a cosmic accident. But beloved by God. Made to be like God. Not God to be like man made in the image of God, and man encompasses both male and female, both male and female. I'll let you remain seated. Continuing in, in Genesis 2, thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. And there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the ground and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man in the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in e Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first was Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havila where there is gold and the gold of that land is good. Bdelium and the onyx stones are there. The name of the second river is Gihon which is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hittakel, which is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. I will pause to say that the next time I read that, all of those words will probably be pre pronounced differently, but try not to notice. Verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them, and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman and he brought her to the man and Adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh and they were both naked the man and his wife and were not ashamed so we learn about man and we continue to learn about man in Genesis chapter 2. According to verse 18, man was not created to be solitary. Man was not created to be solitary. 
to be independent, to be isolated, not to be independent from others, and certainly not to be independent of God. God is one, yet an us. Genesis 1. Man is created in the image of God, in similitude to God, therefore man is to be an us. Man was not created to be solitary. Woman is an equal. She is an equal. Comparable, comparable, a helper, a helpmeet, a counterpart. It is not good that man should be alone. And then God goes about and makes a provision for a helpmeet. It comes right after the direction on how to avoid sinning. The helper seemingly being a helpful provision to avoid sin. Man was not created to be solitary. Woman is an equal. And marriage is here established by God. Verse 24, marriage is here established as described there in verse 24. One man, one woman, the two becoming one flesh. Genesis chapter 3. This is God speaking. Take note. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, <laughs> You will not surely die for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil so the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise she took its fruit and ate she also gave to her husband with her and he ate then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering, coverings. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you shall, should not eat? Then the, woman, then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The certain. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between her, your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel." To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of the knowledge, or from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Genesis 3. 
verse 1, Satan addressed the woman. Satan addressed the woman. This is just an observation. But you have, you have the poster boy for problems with authority. Um, appears to be bucking the system that God established and approaches the woman about something that God told Adam. The woman responded, and in saying that, the woman responded, the woman stepped up. The woman stepped up and responded. There in verse 6, we see that the man stood there. The woman stepped up, the man stepped back. Verses 9 and 11, God approached who? The man. So God still operates in accordance with the order he has established, even though Adam and Eve did not, did not operate according to it. God continued to operate according to the order he had established. The man blames the woman, even tries to implicate God, the woman whom you gave to be with me. The woman blames the serpent, And then in verse 16, it says that the woman will desire the position of the man. The woman will desire the position of the man. But as we've already observed, the order remains established. It says there, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. You're going to want that role but that's his role. Even after sin, God still approached the man for an accounting. And then God, in the next verse, clarifies, clarifies the point, articulating what really happened, telling Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and you have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. So the man listened to, the man regarded, the man obeyed the woman rather than God. Is that not simple? Is that not clear? Remember that uh, uh, the kiss, keep it simple. Keep it simple, salamander. Uh, allow this to be clear. Do not project confusion. I called Mariah this past week, and she said, hey, how's it going? How's your message going? And I'm like, I, I, I told her I was frustrated because I'm trying to communicate how the Bible speaks with simplicity and clarity, and I'm getting all jumbled up doing so. And then she says, you're making it complicated? And I'm like, yes! Yes, I'm making it complicated. Whoa, that's exactly what I'm doing. It's not that God's word is not clear. It's how we suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And we try to make everything to be gray. We try to make it unclear and imperceptibly not simple. Dear people, we are, we, are, we are surrounded by attempts to undermine order. But with, with the dissolving of order comes the dissolving of value. We look at things and say, oh, hey, we love police, but let's defund the police. But in the, in the process, there are attacks on order, and there is a widespread devaluing of the people involved. We're going to devalue, we're going to defund the police and undermine order by villainize those whose task is to maintain order. I'm not making some political statement, I'm just making observations. We have the, the dismissal of marriage. We have people avoiding marriage. Fewer and fewer people entering the institution. There is a, a active desires to redefine what and for whom is marriage? There is the dissolving of the family. 
which holds brokenness and, and therefore abandons the established model, declaring the family unnecessary, redefining the family to whatever remotely functional construction we can determine, and devaluing the family by undermining the established cohesive parties involved, a husband and a father, a wife and a mother, communicating that such roles do not matter and are easily replaced. I, I will make this, this point, dear people. Uh, that, that's the way you demoralize people. I, I gave the example uh, last week about when Mariah and I were freshly married and she, every night she was just making lovely meals. And she said, what would you like tomorrow? And I said, I don't know, just maybe like macaroni and cheese, just something I don't have to appreciate. Um, for the record, I really like macaroni and cheese. I had explained that to one of you afterwards. I really do like macaroni and cheese. And for the record, Mariah makes a phenomenal homemade macaroni and cheese, but that's not at all the point. But, but what was it? When we, when we say, I want something that doesn't matter, it devalues that thing something that does not have to be appreciated. I'll also make this statement. Men are quite disinclined to step into a role that is already being occupied. But there is even a discounting the established order for the church, arguing that the husband of one wife, 1 Timothy 3, that could apply to a woman. And so women step up, men step back. Whether, whether it's men stepped back and women stepped up, which came first, this is going to be a tendency because of the fall. And then neither are operating in their proper role. And if men can fill women's roles and women can fill men's roles, that's because it doesn't matter. Where's value going? So goes order, so goes value. And all of a sudden, there's nothing special about being a man. There's nothing special about being a woman. Order is upended and both parties are devalued. So it's not especially surprising that now we find ourselves where there is confusion on who is male or female because we've already concluded that such distinctions have no meaning. I'm not making a political statement here. But with God's simple and clear word, there is order that confers value. And we depart from it to our own demise. I'll tell you this now that I'm done. But we could have just closed in prayer after Frank's prayer. Because <laughs> that was great. We read this this past week. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, for this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It's not that hard. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that, you may, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. See, I have put before you life and death, uh, life and good, death and evil. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear 
and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go and to possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life. And the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord Will we say, thanks be to God, or will we say, as we just read uh, also in Deuteronomy, or will we say, like, yeah, but this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm looking for direction. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good. You you have made things such that, that you will communicate with us in a way that we can understand. And so I pray that our desire would be just to to understand rather than to make this complicated in order to fit into something else. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before, thank you, Joe. Sorry, uh, Joni, I didn't mean to give you the hold it finger. Um. Uh, Two quick things. Uh, One is that the love offering for the Honeybinds to help them uh, with their travel expenses and to to settle in Racine uh, for a time. Then those, uh, if you came prepared for that, the the ushers will will wait on you just as you exit uh, to receive that offering for the Honeybinds. And then secondly, if there are some uh, strapping... I'm, okay, I'm going to say that after this message, I'm, I'm looking for some men. Um, women don't make us look bad by jumping in on this. Uh, guys, there's a vacancy. We need help setting up platform for VBS. And so if we could have uh, some workers, that would be appreciated. Thank you. We are dismissed. <laughs>